Hey, welcome back. Good to see you. Well, here we are, wrapping up to the end of Philosophical Inquiry with a talk today about the so-called problem of evil. If there's one thing that I hope to have impressed on you this semester, both when we were in the classroom, back when we were all still friends, and even now, under quarantine, um, I've tried to impress upon you that philosophy, in the tradition in which I work, philosophy is about problems, philosophical problems, which take the form of very specific questions and attempts to answer those questions using arguments. Arguments. And I know I can't quiz you anymore on the definition of an argument. It's a set of statements, some of which are meant to provide evidence for some of the others. Remember that? I know I can't quiz you on that anymore, but just to let you know, come fall, if we're back on campus, and if not in the fall, then come spring, I'm going to find you on campus right when you least expect it. I'm going to sneak up behind you. I'm going to say, hey, you, what's an argument? Give me the definition. And if you can't tell me, I'm going to fine you $35 on the spot. Come to think of it, actually, it might be problematic for me to start mugging undergraduates. Okay, so forget the mugging part, but I do hope that you'll remember the definition of an argument for years and years to come. Because arguments are the tools that philosophers use to try to answer these big questions that we're dealing with. Remember, way back at the beginning, way back at the beginning, the example, I gave you what I thought was a fairly easy example, the Gettier problem. What was the question? The question was, what is knowledge? And to answer that, we said, well, maybe it would help if we change it into a statement. Somebody knows something, if and only if, and then we had to figure out the conditions. What conditions have to be met for it to be true that I know that there is a pandemic happening? And we said, well, I have to believe it. That's a necessary condition. I have to have some justification in believing it, right? If I believe it because the fortune teller told me so, eh, that's not knowledge. If I believe it because I'm psychotic, that's not justification. Because it has to be true. I have to have a true, justified belief. That was the initial proposal for knowledge. And do you remember... Can you give me an example of, example of a Gettier problem? What's a Gettier problem look like? A Gettier problem is an instance where somebody has a true justified belief, but we wouldn't call it knowledge. As they say, a broken clock is right twice a day. I go into a room at four o'clock. I look at the clock. Hey, it's four o'clock. So I believe it's four o'clock. It's true it's four o'clock. I believe it's four o'clock. Am I justified? Sure. Clocks are good justification for telling time. Yet it doesn't seem like knowledge. It seems like I got a little too lucky. Okay, I'm just reviewing that Gettier problem stuff from way back at the beginning of the semester, because that was a kind of an easier philosophical problem to follow. That's what I'd like to give to, to help ease you into our new game, our new way of thinking that I'm trying to impart upon you. <clears throat> and we talked about other problems. We talked about the Euthyphro problem. Yes, yes, I see you. I know you still would like me to tell you about Eleanor Stump and the Euthyphro problem. And I will. I'm going to make a special bonus video about that. I promise, okay? I'll try to get to it by the end of the week. Okay, quit pestering me about that. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, I appreciate uh, a couple of you have emailed me and asked me about the Euthyphro problem, and I, I was so happy. I said, oh, that's right. I did promise them. I'll get there. We considered some other philosophical problems, like the nature of the state. What is the state? What are our obligations within society? What is a human being? We read a whole book about that by Herbert McCabe. What is the nature of change? How does change take place? 
We thought we were able to give a good account of change if we subscribe to a theory known as matter and formism. Of course, that theory is rejected by Descartes later on, because Descartes' question was, how can we be certain about anything? And so all along the way, we've been looking at philosophical questions and trying to answer them by way of argument. Well, today I'd like to finish with one more philosophical problem. It's a little bit of a trickier one to work our way through. There's a more moving parts, but I think you're going to be able to do it. I think you're going to like it. It's called the problem of evil. What is the problem of evil? Caffeinated. Caffeine, uh, caffeine field philosophy. That's what I like. So a kind of classic formulation of the problem of evil is um, this guy back in the 50s named J.L. Mackey, M-A-C-K-I-E. Um, he noted, and there's a lot of logic lurking in the background here that I don't want to try to talk you through today, but he noted that there's something inconsistent, inconsistent in the following statements. Something has to go in the following set of statements. There is a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. I'll say it again. There is a God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. Something good tries to eliminate evil insofar as possible. There is quite a bit of unnecessary evil. There's quite a bit of unnecessary evil. So, something seems off here, right? Something seems off. Imagine if Superman said he was going to stop fighting crime. You know, he's just tired. He goes down the street, he sees the burning building, he hears the baby crying, and he just goes, uh, not today, I am really just want to take the day off, have a burrito. We'd say Superman was kind of a jerk. We'd say Superman was kind of a jerk, right? He's able to save that baby in that building. He knows there's a baby suffering in that building. And yet, he seems to not be doing a good job that we would expect. Well, if God is all-powerful, can do anything, and all-good, and all-knowing, what's, all what's up with all the suffering in the world? What's up with racism? What's up with war, famine, pestilence, and I mean even even stuff that I mean uh, uh, is out of our control. Coronavirus, right? I mean, right now there's a, you know a lot of discussion about how some governments, ours included, may have been able to do a better job preparing for the pandemic, but the coronavirus isn't a human invention. It was going to get some people no matter what. Um, <clears throat> the only way that could have been stopped is if God had never created coronavirus. So, concludes Mackey, what ought we to give up in those three statements. I'll give you three statements. What were they? There is a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good. Something good eliminates evil insofar as possible. Yet there's a great amount of unnecessary evil. What should we give up? Well, you will not be surprised to learn that Mackey says we should give up on the claim that there is an all-good, 
all-powerful, all-knowing God. After all, it's obvious that there's it's just obvious that there's unnecessary evil. I don't know I don't know how you would ever convince me that there looks like you know some of the suffering in this world doesn't actually play any fa any role that I can figure out anyways, right? <clears throat> And it does, it seems to be, uh, and the, the, Mackey in this famous paper recognizes that the, the weak part of his argument has to do with the claim that um, something good eliminates evil insofar as possible. He does a lot of work to justify that claim, but it looks, it, it does look to be on all fours, right? I mean, a good washing machine, we don't say, you know, a good washing machine doesn't eliminate racism, that's, but that's not something washing machines are, are supposed to do. When I say something good eliminates evil insofar as it can, what I mean is that a good washing machine eliminates foul odors and dirty stains. Now imagine if, uh, imagine if you had a washing machine that uh, didn't, never got a stain out, it couldn't get the simplest stain out, right? Uh, or, you know, you put in the clothes and they come out smelling worse than when you put it in. You would say that's just a bad washing machine, right? It's defective. It's defective. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to lie. In the 20th and 21st centuries, the problem of evil has been um, the hardest to overcome uh, for many philosophers. Uh, in the 20th and 21st century, the problem of evil is the point at which many philosophers have said that we should just uh, abandon theism. Um, a recent poll of philosophers showed that some 70% of professional philosophers, meaning uh, philosophers who are either uh, holding a PhD or, or um, finishing their PhD dissertations, some 70% identify as atheist. And of those 70%, if you were to, to survey the majority as to why, the most common answer would be something having to do with the problem of evil. They think that's, that's the decisive evidence against the existence of God. Okay. So I've set out the problem. Here's the problem. How can somebody consistently claim that there is an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God, and yet also face the obvious fact that there's still immense suffering, uh, immensely unnecessary evils, and the apparently logical truth that good things drive out or eliminate suffering in so far as possible. Well, now I'm going to give you a philosophical strategy, a strategy for thinking about philosophical problems, that if you can get good at this strategy, I mean, if you master this strategy, I mean, you have to get better at this strategy than I am so far. You, yeah, you, and you can become one of the philosophical greats. I mean, if I look at the, the, the best philosophers, whether it's Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, Occam, Scotus, Descartes, Immanuel Kant, David Hume, Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, Herbert McCabe, there's one thing Elizabeth Anscombe, Peter Geech, and uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, all these philosophers have one mastered skill, one skill that they excelled at beyond every B-rate philosopher and certainly every C or D-rate philosopher that there is. And here's what it is. They look at a proposal, at a philosophical argument, at a 
philosophical explanation. And then they ask themselves one question. What assumption is lurking in the background that can be challenged? What is the assumption that is lurking in the background of this argument? When, what, what is an assumption, you ask me? An assumption is, you remember what a premise is. Think of an assumption as a silent premise, an unstated premise. We make a lot of assumptions in, in our day-to-day -day thinking, right? <clears throat> but uh, you want an example of an assumption example. Remember, Hume, Hume pointed out that a great deal of our thinking assumes the future will be like the past. And yet Hume showed you can never prove the future will be like the past. Last week, I went up to Taco Bell and got some tacos. Last night, I went up to Taco Bell and got some tacos. Oh my god, I hope you people are doing better than me when it comes to staying healthy during the pandemic. Well, so, what would happen if I went to Taco Bell tonight? Would I be able to get some tacos? I assume, I assume so. When I tell my mother, Mom, I'm going to Taco Bell, and she says, what for? And I say, to get tacos. It would be kind of weird if she was like, what? Tacos at Taco Bell? Are you insane? What would make you think you can do that? What would make me think I can do that? I assume. The future will be like the past. See, I don't even have to say it. Well, I, I don't have to, well, Mom, let's uh, review here. The future tends to be like the past. Right? Hume's genius was uncovering that assumption in our thought. So, the problem of evil, which seems to, the problem of evil, which seems to show that there's an inconsistency in believing there is an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God. That evil uh, is eliminated by what is good insofar as possible. And that there is a great amount of eliminable evil. Well, what assumptions are lurking in the past? What assumptions are lurking in the background? What is it that's not being said? that if we could just pinpoint it and attack it, the whole structure falls apart. Have any thoughts? Go ahead, pause the video if you'd like. Jot something down in the comm box if you'd like. I don't mind, I won't mind. If we were together right now, I would be looking for raised hands. I'd be saying, hey, you, you you're, you're, you're nodding off. Wake back up. Wake back up. Come on. What's the little, uh, assumption lurking in the background here? What's the assumption that's lurking in the background when I say there can be no God, given that God is all good, all powerful, and all um, knowing, and suffering exists, and suffering's eliminated by something that's good? Oh, what, 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 what's my assumption? Here's where somebody like McCabe has brilliant insight. The assumption lurking in the background is our old friend, fresh out of the 17th century, that we call theistic personalism. Theistic personalism. Theistic personalism. There's a reason that somebody like Thomas Aquinas never really confronts the problem of evil as I've just laid it out. He has other issues that you might think look like the problems of evil, but they're really not quite the same. You see, I left you a little clue at the beginning of this lecture. I left you a little clue when I said, what would be the problem with Superman if he stopped saving children? Well, the answer is Superman is a lot like us. Superman has moral obligations. Superman can be 
good by being a good person. Superman can be good by being morally good. And what does it mean to be morally good? To be morally good is to act within a community of other persons. Well, what happens if I jettison the whole notion that God is a person? What happens if I just drop it? What happens if I just get rid of that belief that God is a person? Aquinas will say we still have good reasons for thinking that God is good. We have arguments that God is good. Basically, the argument that God is good, uh, and perfect even, is that God is unimprovable. God cannot be improved upon. Um, but Aquinas would not, and McCabe is doing a brilliant job of teasing this out by putting God on trial, Aquinas would never, for a moment, think that God is morally good. God is not morally good. God is not morally bad. God is not what philosophers call a moral agent. You're a moral agent. I'm a moral agent. What's a moral agent? A moral agent is something that be, can be morally good or morally bad, i.e. people. One day, my dad and I we went out and got some steaks on a Friday night. This is my dad and I, we had this Friday ritual. He would, you know, my parents were separated, but he would pick me up uh, for the weekend, go to the store, get a couple steaks, bring them home, start up the grill, uh, watch some uh, cheap TV. We used to watch uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, that old cartoon. Um, start the steaks on the grill. Anyways, one night we went home, put the steaks on the table, went out in the back, started up the grill, came back inside, and damn, Sheba the dog. Sheba the dog had eaten both of our steaks. Now, why did we say bad girl? We said bad girl in the hopes of doing what we call Pavlovian conditioning. Maybe putting some fear into her the next time she has an opportunity to steal our steaks. But Sheba wasn't morally bad, right? We don't say, like, like Sheba, don't you know that's morally wrong to eat other people's steaks? Now, imagine if you're over there at Buffalo Wild Wings, sitting down with some food, and as soon as your head's turned, as soon as you get up to go get some ketchup from the counter, I run over and I take all your food and I eat it. You come over, are you going to be like, bad boy, in the hopes that maybe I'll be Pavlovian conditioned not to do that next time? No, you're going to come over and be like, Kovach, you're a real jerk. You are a bad person, and I don't want you in my life anymore. See, that's because you recognize that Kovach is a moral agent. Kovach has moral obligations as a result of being in a community of other moral agents. Well, what obligations does God have? What can possibly be obligating God? to act a certain way. <clears throat> and if you're a theistic personalist, if you're a theistic person, if you're, if you're just wedded to the concept that God is a person, well then you might say, as some theists do, like Richard Swinburne and some others, that God is obligated to act according to some moral law. Right? And then I think, I think, you're going to have a real difficult time trying to solve the problem of evil. Are there solutions available to theistic personalists? They try. Oh, every year, another 200 papers get published in the philosophy journals by theistic personalists trying to solve the problem of evil. Oh, sometimes it's the... Um, we can't see the big... I mean, this is actually probably the, the best version I've seen from Theistic Personal. It's an argument called we cannot see the big picture argument. Right? That God permits people to do bad things. And it's not up to us to try to figure out why. God has a bigger plan. A plan that we can't see. 
Um, Aquinas, Aquinas, by the way, Aquinas is sympathetic to that line of thinking. That line of thinking is available on the classical theistic account. Um, and I think it's the best a theistic personalist can do. But I think it's, on its own, I think it's pretty thin. I think it's pretty thin, that line of thought. I think that line of thought takes on a more full life, that we cannot see the big picture of what God's plan is. That claim takes on a life once we give up the whole problem of trying to figure out why God seems to do things that we would consider immoral, right? God could have prevented coronavirus. Now, here is sometimes the theistic personalist will say, well, maybe it's, and it's always some speculation, maybe it's part of God's plan that by having us all live in quarantine, we're going to learn how to work more cooperatively and uh, work together better. Uh, uh, and some of these home religious services, that, you know, people's spiritual lives are actually being strengthened by coronavirus. You know what? If God's omnipotent, God could have done that without, you know, half a million deaths. That's right. If God's omnipotent, God could have brought about us acting more socially cooperatively and developing a, a fuller spiritual life without coronavirus killing 100,000 people. And hey, I would have. You know, think about, think about, you know, suppose, uh, suppose, uh, uh, you know, you and I get together, we say, yeah, wouldn't it be great if human beings could uh, act more socially cooperatively? Yeah, that would be great. And you know, what if we started developing these home spiritual bases? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be, oh, that would be great. No, 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 let's figure out a way to do that. Let's figure out a way to really do, got it. Deadly virus. I'm going to release a deadly virus. You're going to look at me like, you monster. Are you insane? Right? The means don't justify those ends. And I would be a monster. So why isn't God a monster? Well, I think once we admit that the whole concept of God being a moral monster makes no sense. Remember the theory of categories? The theory of categories is you have to put the right predicate with the right subject. And on the classical theist's account, the concept, the predicate, moral monster, just doesn't fit with the word God. Well, now once I've given up that, once I've given up theistic personalism, once I've given up my obsession with saying God as a person, now, now the idea that God allows, permits, and in a sense even causes. God causes every condition. God causes every atom in the universe to be as it is in the situation it's in. And why? Now I can now I'm much more comfortable with the idea that it's for a plan I don't understand, right? Now I'm much more comfortable with that. So anyway, I'm trying to give you a just like I gave you the Gettier problem at the beginning of the semester, I'm trying to give you a more complicated one now. The problem of evil and showing how a philosopher can go about thinking about it. Maybe you're not convinced of the classical theist's account. Maybe you're not convinced of classical theism or theistic personalism uh, or either of our responses to the problem of evil. But a lot happens in philosophy just by uncovering the assumptions that goes on in the background of someone's thought and questioning that assumption. Here the assumption is, is that when I say God is good, I mean that God is morally good. Okay, well, I've rambled on about the problem of evil enough for a while now. I find a lot of students have a lot to say about the problem of evil. I mean, in the very first semester I was ever teaching, I had no intention of getting into the problem of evil. No intention whatsoever. Um, I had presented some argument or other for the existence of God. I don't even think it was Aquinas at that time. I think I had presented it as someone's ontological argument. And no sooner that I was, you know, at the conclusion of the argument, I remember a guy, a great student, his name was Frank. He raised his hand and he said, then why does so much crap happen? I had no intention of even thinking about that question. 
So I suspect students have things to say about the problem of evil, and I look forward to reading you in the com box below. Um, there'll be one or two more videos this semester. They'll be very short. They'll have to do with some advice about writing your papers. So look forward to that. Look forward to hearing from you soon. Good luck getting through the home stretch of the semester. Hey, if this is your first year of college, uh, what a ride. Actually, if it's your fourth year of college, what a ride. Or your third year, what a ride. Um, but I hope you're all well. Um, if there's anything you need, uh, never hesitate to uh, reach out to me.